Oh, all right. Okay, buddy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Rule of Two. I'm Mark Fernandez. I'm joined by uh, Star Wars Theory. That's his real name. And, of course, today we have um, Phil Tippett, uh, American movie director, Oscar winner, Emmy Award winner, uh, BAFTA winner, I believe. Uh, you know, the accolades have, uh, you know, go on and on. But uh, to me, he's, you know, he's the guy who, uh, who made Jabba the Hutt, the guy who made the Rancor, um, the guy who um, created um, the stop motion in Jurassic Park, um, the guy who created the stop motion armatures that connected to the computers for the CGI dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're very, very happy, and you can tell I'm a little bit excited that Mr. Phil Tippett is joining us today in, on Rule of Two. Yeah, there were no, there were no, there was no stop motion in Jurassic Park except for some early tests we did. The uh, what, wasn't there, wasn't there some stop motion going on with the with the raptors in the kitchen or something like that, or in the T Rex paddock? Yeah, but it was, it was a, it was puppets. Of, it was a turning point. They were essentially stop motion animation armatures, but they weren't covered with anything. And they were hooked up to a number of encoders that could um, encode the rotations and the, the hinge movements. And then that fed into the computer and we had a wireframe so that we could see. So it was like a, it was the bridge between stop motion and um, computer graphics. Uh, I mean, yeah, and look, we'll get into Jurassic Park a ton. Let's go, let's travel back uh, in time um, before uh, 1977. Um, we had Dennis Murin on the show uh, a few weeks ago, and I know that you worked with Dennis in um, the uh, advertising world and the commercial world, um, and you met Dennis prior to getting on Star Wars. Um, tell me a little bit about meeting Dennis Murin and the kind of journey that took you to work on uh, the first Star Wars? Uh, well, I was able to get in touch with uh, Jim Danforth, who was one of my mentors, and he was working at Cascade Pictures of California. And I asked him if I could come up for a tour, and so I went up there. And Dennis happened to be uh, showing the effects reel from the Equinox and uh, in their screening room at Cascade. And that's where we met. And... Um... Did, what, was Dennis the one that brought you into Star Wars, or did you guys parallel path into the Star Wars uh, 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 picture? No, it was kind of a long thing. You know, I was working someplace where an old Navy buddy of Richard Edlund's uh, worked, and he said, hey, I got a friend that's making a science fiction film, and he's looking for people, so I gave Richard a call. And he was looking for cameramen, so I didn't do that, and I... Uh, you know, got him in touch with Dennis. Dennis got hired. He hired Ken Ralston. And then while it was getting down to the very end of the film, George was unhappy with the cantina scene and wanted more space aliens in it. And um, it was there when we were making the cantina stuff that he saw I did stop motion, which gave him the idea to do, uh, do the chess set of stop motion. Theo, do you want to... Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I saw some pictures online of you with the the Wampa. Uh, did you have any sort of uh, work on that? Yeah, I made it. Cool. Can um, you take us through everything from essentially? I want to know everything from the beginning. So you know, how how did you get the job? You know, what was it like working with George? Well, uh, I mean, the Wampa there, came all right this. at the end of things, like a lot of George's stuff. You know, he you know will you know the editing and then at the end he goes like oh I gotta fix this, gotta fix that. But the the thing that they had made on location um was horrible. It looked stupid. It looked like something from Lost in Space. And um so I I asked him if I could, you know, remake it into something more interesting. And he said, Yeah, sure, go ahead. So, you know, <laughs> put it together and, you know, I put it together in a couple of days and then we got Paul Hirsch, the editor, and Joe Johnston and yeah. me and I made a very simple rig where you could push it and the mouth would open and, you know, we got the shot. And, and what was your process to start sketching stuff out on paper to start getting a kind of like a, like an illustrative feel to it and then build little 
mock-ups of it? Like, like what, what's your process when you're creating these creatures? Um, you know, uh, you know, I can do both, but I found with George that he really responded to three-dimensional maquettes, small, so he could, you know, turn them in the light. He could see them, and then the characters would come alive as opposed to a pencil drawing or something. Can you take us through the Dejeric chess set that you made? Because I remember seeing that as a kid, and I, I wanted a holographic chess set like that. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I got a marauding squirrel here. I'm gonna have to throw something at it. <laughs> <laughs> is it a stop motion squirrel? Or is it a real squirrel? You had an actual look. An actual squirrel in there. Oh, oh no, yeah, there, is, there is a squirrel in your. I've been trying to train it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the revenge, the revenge of the squirrel. That's awesome. You've gotten very aggressive, so I have oh, to. Oh yeah. Think. Oh, they're vicious little creatures. No, yeah, but I've gotten him to eat out of my hand. So. Oh okay okay so maybe that's you know maybe he wants he came back for more. Um, yeah, I had to close the door for the food store. So, so when so it I came to uh, wait, yeah, yeah, when yeah, it came, yeah when it came to creating Jabba, um, I know originally like in the film he was supposed to be a human or something, and then it changed. Um, what were the other concept designs? How did you come up with Jabba? What was your thought process? Well, I went through a you know a, a period of a you know a few weeks or a few months where. Uh, uh, Joe Johnston and Neil Rodas and Ralph McQuarrie and I all contributed uh, designs for Jabba. Mm -hmm. and, um, and George, yeah, it was a really important character, so George kept rejecting it until um, uh, you know, I did three maquettes, and on the third one, he said, yeah, that's it. That, that's Jabba. You know, so. I, and while, while we were doing it, you know, I I, uh, the first one was rejected. The second one was rejected. And so I asked him specifically, well, if you were able to cast any actor to do this part, who would it be? And George said, Sydney Greenstreet. And that just gave me total, okay, I get it. You know, I, I know who the character is. So that's what, it yeah. Was. I want yeah. to Google that right now. I don't know I've seen that, that picture of Sydney Greenstreet. Greenstreet. Yeah. He looks like, uh, he looks like, like like the mayor of Monopoly, you know he's oh, like yeah. he's, he's oh like wow yeah oh wow yeah I've I've seen him in old movies yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is like the things my parents introduced me to when I was growing up that's what we all grew up around so our language was you know movies from the old silent movies and movies from the twenties yeah. thirties and forties. And, uh, you know, during the heyday of Hollywood. So that was all of our language, you know, that we spoke. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's um, cool. The, the, uh, the Rancor in uh, Return of the Jedi um, originally was supposed to be kind of like a King Kong, Godzilla, man in a suit. Um, and then you came in there and um, designed the actual Rancor that, that, you know, we saw in the film. Uh, no, was that another... It's the other way around. You know, I, I designed uh, our, our creature for Rancor. And, and again, Joe and uh, Milo and Ralph, you know, contributed designs. But the design that I had made was not for a man in a suit. And George said, you know, he wanted the best Godzilla ever. And so we spent, you know, a number of weeks, you know, making a man in a suit version. And it just didn't work because... It wasn't designed to work that way. So at mm -hmm. that point, George said, okay, do whatever you want to do. And it was right up against the end <laughs> of the schedule, too. You know, so we just had to, you know, initially we were thinking about doing it with stop and go motion, but we had literally run up out of time. So Dennis came up with the idea of shooting it as a high-speed hand puppet. And, and what's, what's, what, what's the difference um, between the hand puppet and the stop motion, like, Back in those days, when you were making decisions whether to go hand puppets or puppets or hand or, or stop motion, like what kind of factors played into deciding which of the two approaches was was best? Just practicality, you know, whatever was the 
the best way of doing it, you know. How did you do the scene where Luke shoved the the bone in his mouth and he snapped it? Well, we put a bone in his mouth. <laughs> and that's it? Well, no, we made a special bone that uh, that was cast in some kind of plastic, and then there was some shards, and it was super thin. And I was operating the head of Rancor, and so we just, you know, Luke goes like that, and then in a shot of him and then the rancor reels back and he's got a bone and he crunches it and there's splinters that go off you know so um yeah but the difference between you know stop motion or go motion work and what we did for rancor was uh you know stop motion is very uh you know it's a very slow process and it's you kind of got to get into a meditative state and just kind of change how you look at time and experience it and translate that into this puppet using you know frames as your uh guide to the performance but with the uh, rancor just because we had to get it done um we shot at high speed so it's absolutely the opposite we were shooting between 76 and you know, 120 frames an hour and so the performances would literally be like a second long and you just go bah, 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 bah. and um Hmm. Tom Santamon was working the hands, another guy was working the feet, and um, we didn't know what we were going to get. We didn't have any playback at that time, and so we we would shoot all day long and bring the stuff into dailies, and George would ask, how many pit takes did you do? And he said, 60. And, and he went, well, why don't you just pick the five that are the best and send it over to editorial? Hmm. Hmm. Was he a tough guy to work with? Hell no, no, he was a great boss. Very um, supportive and encouraging. Yeah. That's like so nice that. to hear. Because you figure, you know, a guy like that with all that imagination and a specific vision would be very um, specific about the stuff that he receives, but it's cool that it seems like he no, gave you guys a lot of free reign. George is a little bit like a, a documentary filmmaker where the um, for the Jabba's palace scene, he just said, you know, make me a bunch of space aliens. And there, there wasn't, all it said, there's, you know, aliens and, you know, Jabba's, you know, palace. And so he said, make me up a bunch of aliens. And so every week we would get together and show him what we had created as little cats and he would just go through and pick it out like this is a dancer this is uh playing the piano this guy is admiral akbar this guy is um you know whoever you know and uh so now what they're doing is they're i'm not a fan of it but i guess it plays into the continuity of star wars today they take certain characters from what george created in the originals and they say okay this is this guy now this is that guy then you know, like, for example, Rex is supposed to be um, some dude with a mustache and beard on Endor. And it's like, I don't think George even knew who Rex was at that point. And now people are saying, okay, Echo is this new guy that uh, uh, is a clone that turned into a cyborg. And he was in the cantina in episode four. And it's like, did George ever have an idea of who these, a backstory for each alien you know, character? Or was I, he just oh, yeah, I, I didn't understand a word you said. You know, because when we were done with Return of the Jedi, we were done. And it was like, you know, from Star Wars to Jedi, it was like being sentenced to, you know, three consecutive terms in high school, you know. And so by the end, we were all just ready to move on. And and I, I just haven't followed Star Wars since. I don't know any of the names for things or anything. Gotcha. What what, one thing that I do think is very interesting to, to Theory's point tangentially, um, in the script for Empire Strikes Back, um, the, the Tauntaun, if I'm getting this correct, was described as a walking lizard. Um, and that's basic a snow sorry, lizard. A snow lizard. Yeah. And basically, that's all you have on to sort of create um, the creature that eventually g gets on screen, right? It's not like you have. Um, any kind of um, uh, direction or anything. You just have those three words. George was really loose, you know, and uh, 
Yeah, it's he said, you know, it's a like a like a horse and it's a snow lizard. And so he asked me to come up with some ideas. So I, uh, I spent a couple of days drawing out, you know, uh, you know, a couple dozen uh, paper sketches of it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And um, he picked one and asked to see a, a three-dimensional maquette. And I brought it to him and he said, yeah, that's the Tom Tom. So that's how that went. And was it true that Mark Hamill was upset that, uh, well, actually, I don't know if you would know this, but apparently he was upset that he had to cut off the arm of the wampa because he was against <laughs> against uh, animal cruelty. He's like, well, the Wampa was just hungry, you know, whatever. It's not a big deal. And then uh, apparently they lied to him during filming the scene. It's a monster. That's... <laughs> <laughs> it's trying to eat you. His arms off. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That's yeah, I awesome. agree. So, so look, um, we. it's a good segue, and I'm sure we'll get back into Star Wars, but after you graduated high school from Return of the Jedi, um, I think you went on one of the most interesting journeys and I'm probably going to get some stuff wrong, but this is the way that I've kind of always seen it. Um, to me, uh, Jurassic Park is probably like top five most important science, like true science fiction films um, ever made because it popularized um, a theory in, um, in, in biology that birds uh, were the direct descendants of dinosaurs. And uh, back back before then, right, like dinosaurs were m much more seen as just lizards and the way they walked was different and all that stuff. You made a stop motion film in 1985, if I believe it's called Prehistoric Beasts, mm -hmm. um, where you start to see some of these elements of the chicken like bird like movements in the dinosaurs. There's one scene where you see a dinosaur in the back. I believe it's a T-Rex and he's walking on two legs without the tail on the ground and stuff. Uh, was this something that you had already been like hip to before the Jurassic Park stuff? Like some of these new theories in biology around uh, dinosaurs and their relationship to modern day birds and stuff? Well, I saw King Kong when I was about five years old on television, like 1956. And I was wowed by that. And then I, I just, you know, I didn't play, you know, football or, you know, baseball with the kids in the neighborhood. I get my parents to drop me off at the public library and just go through all of their books and just study paleontology like crazy for a number of years. And, you know, so that's what kind of put me in the, the spot to do Jurassic Park because I, I knew the production process from pre-production to production to post-production. And I also knew a shitload about dinosaurs and was up on all the latest theories. I mean, the whole dinosaur bird thing was old news by the time Jurassic Park's went around. Mm -hmm. Those were theories that were very, uh, you know, breakthrough theories in the mid seventies. Mm. I see. Yeah. I mean, because for me as a kid, when I was watching that movie, I, I had never made that kind of connection before. Right. And that movie kind of popularized that. And, right. and, you know, I think inspired a lot of people to look at dinosaurs completely differently, you know, as like, um, completely differently like even the land before time or, or I, I think that came out before jurassic park the the dinosaurs are represented in a very very different way but um the way that you got your jurassic park gig was through george lucas right george was the one that recommended you to steven spielberg yeah steven was asking around and, and you know george said phil's your man so <laughs> and and how did how did george know that you were like the dinosaur guy I had sent him prehistoric beasts at some point. I don't know if he ever saw it, but he just knew it. You know, he, I mean, right. yeah. did, did, did George ever hit you back up to work on like Willow or any, any of the Indiana Jones pictures or, or, yeah, or any of the, yeah, I, I, I did that two headed thing in the in Willow and some other, you know, shots. And then, Oh, I, nice. I helped Dennis out on the Temple of Doom. I made the guy that get, goes down with the. Um, the oh uh, no way! The guy who burns up and like, uh, like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a radio control thing. It was a very impressive set that Dennis did. Everything was done in camera on set, and it was a, just a very elaborate set with lava running in the bottom, and smoke and steam. And then I also uh, made all of the. 
mine car chase characters. It was more, you know, like it wasn't stuff that I was that interested in doing. But, you know, Dennis needed some help, so I helped him out. So of all the characters that you've made uh, in all the movies, which one did you enjoy creating the most? Or are they all the same? They're not all the same, you know. I mean, I think you judge movies not by, I mean, at least I do. I kind of subscribe to the Verna Field School of um, filmmaking. He's like, you might, if you're lucky, work on a half a dozen success, successful movies in your career. And a lot of people don't even, you know, work on that many. And so what you walk away from, then you work on a lot of trash and mediocre stuff. And what you walk away from is uh, the experience is uh, the interactions you've had with all the people. I mean, when you're working on a movie set, you, you become a family. And, um, and so that's the kind of stuff that you remember, you know? Mm. You just, I mean, it's, it's a day job. It's like you're going in and punching the clock and getting the yeah. work done. You know, and trying to get as much stuff in as you can by the end of the day. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, just pretty practical like any other job. Did you have any sort of uh, consulting advice or anything on the prequels that George went on to create later? No, no. I was so done with all that stuff. You know, I didn't even bother asking. Did you watch them? I watched the first one. We went okay. On to a screen, and, uh, yeah, I never saw any of the subsequent ones. Which actually, the first one came out today, um, however many years ago. In no, it's episode three. No? I think both of them, three and one, both came out today. May 19th. Um, the, the, um, um, I, the, the, I mean, granted, I, I, I only know your career and stuff like that as an admirer and as a fan, as somebody who's tried to research the craft that you're involved with. But um, a lot of the footage that I see of you, a lot of the stories that I see about you say that to this day, you're still actively working on stop motion stuff. So it, it's it's not only a day job, but it's also a hobby and a night uh, passion, right? And there's a there's a really cool documentary that I saw of you where you're specifically quoting uh, this passage that you have somewhere in your studio, um, specifically around the concept of, 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 of passion and the struggle there too, and how that kind of defines the creative process for you. So in, in your day job, you're doing the stop motion stuff, but it's also something that carries into your personal passions that you do on your off hours, correct? Well, I don't have any off hours. You know, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm always doing stuff. So most of the work that I've done for the last twenty years has been that God. So you know, I'm just I work on that every single day. And I, but now that we're pretty much wrapped up, I'm working on a sequel to it. So you know, hopefully, oh, I can nice. get somebody to pay me this time. <laughs> <laughs> this time, yeah, that'd be nice. And um, how how are you planning on getting Mad God uh, distributed? What's the current distribution plan for it to, to, to make it go wide? I'm working with some people that know this stuff. You know, I've never, um, uh, I mean, I have made complete movies that were uh, shorts, which are, you know, pretty easy, but a feature to wrap it up is a big fucking deal. And um, so it's, it's just, you know, learning all that, you know, you have to have like agents and promoters and all kinds of stuff to, you know, get the word out. So what, what do you, you're obviously extremely talented and creative. My question to you is, what do you really enjoy working on? Like besides, you know, let's say someone comes to you, hey, here, here's a job, I'll pay you to do this and this. What do you really like to do in your downtime? Um, what fast, what job do you wish that you could do when it comes to creating the stuff you create i only do one thing you know so my days are all the same you know now that i'm, I'm yeah you know, we did a little bit of work on uh, mandalorian we did some you know kind of no way uh, junk walkers yeah stop motion john favreau's a big stop motion fan yeah and uh so we're working with him on some other you know things with stop motion and uh, so there's that. And then, you know, I, I just work, you know, from the time that I get up to, you know, I'll, I'll knock off around five o'clock and write for about an hour and then just, you know, watch the news and whatever's on TV. 
is your is your methodology still pretty consistent with what it was during Star Wars and Empire and Jedi? Or did you take a little bit of that kind of post Jurassic Park stuff? Like I'm I'm fascinated by the concept of the sort of stop motion um like like armature devices that you guys use for the dinosaurs, for example. Like are you implementing some of some of that technology today or, or are you pretty traditional with the way that you're doing um, your modeling and your stop motion stuff? No, that was just an interim uh, technique to get what we wanted. It was because there weren't enough um, computer graphics artists that really understood that kind of work. They were trained to do more commercial work. And so, you know, bringing in people that knew animal behavior and, you know, pose and center of gravity and all that stuff was really important. So I, I hired a couple of guys to do that. And then I, I went back and forth to ILM. I was directing their animators and, you know, coming back and, um, you yeah, know, working with my guys. And then in your process currently for Mad God, do you implore a more traditional stop motion sense or are you adapting it with new technologies that have evolved over the last 20, 30 years? Well, the technologies that have evolved that allow us to, to do it more efficiently is stuff we didn't have back in the day are digital cameras. So you don't have to deal with film or a light meter or anything. You can do it by eye, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's so much easier. And then we have the, you know, playback machine so we can look at what we're doing along the way, which we did not have back in the, in the day. Lear learning yeah. stop motion was a vertical climb, you know, because you'd animate and, um, yeah, you know, when you're a kid, you don't have that much money, so you're shooting on eight millimeter, and you can shoot for six months on a roll, and you send it back to, you know, Rochester, New York, to get processed, and you get it back, and you, you know, you have no idea what you did. It's like <laughs> playing a playing a piano and not hearing it for two weeks, and then trying to. Get back oh man, what you know it was. So yeah, it was it was very slow process what was your work on robocop uh traditional stop motion animation was it robotics because i mean in my head like i just think about robots when when i think about those walkers in in, in robocop but was that all hand hand done stop motion work we built two props one was a full scale uh ed 209 for the dialogue scenes and then uh, the rest all the ambulatory stuff was uh Stop motion. Mm. Yeah, and when it came good. to the to the AT AT, how did you guys um, create that thing? Uh, well, I think the story went. They were looking like, fishing around for a number of ideas, and one of the ideas was radio controlled wheeled vehicles. And I think it was you know uh, Dennis and um, Joe Johnson that convinced George to with a stop motion because it was so much more control and we could make something really weird. <laughs> that, that's like, yeah. yeah, I mean, if, my this, experience with stop motion as a kid was just Lego movies that I would make. So it would move yeah. his hand a little bit, take a picture, take another picture. It would take forever. But uh, so I, I respect your work. I can't imagine what it must have been like, especially with that limited technology back then. Oh, well, I mean, technology changed, and you know, every ten years, so you have to kind of reinvent yourself with going from stop motion to go motion, go motion to computer graphics. You know, now a lot of stuff's being done with the AI. You know, yeah. at, some point, at some point, they're not going to be people touching this stuff anymore. Mm. That's sad. What What was it like? You know, just to get very specific about you know, and like not to, I guess, you know reminisce too much but when you guys as a team of special effects you know pioneers finally saw the kind of cast screening or i'm sorry the crew screening where it was just you guys and the team watching the film like do do you can you recall that and give me one feeling that you remember having when you were watching that well we all knew that it was gonna, it was the movie that we always wanted to work on. We were all admirers of George's previous work. And, um, you know, when we were going to do the cantina or the, 
or the chess set, you know, we saw the scenes that he shot and it was like, oh, this is, you know, the movie we always wanted to work on. And then when it all comes together, you don't see any of this stuff, you know, while you're doing visual effects. All the other work with the sound effects and the final cut music. And um, from the, it's like everybody, you know, the time, from the time the big Sardis lawyer comes over to him, mm. uh, you know, we we're all hooked. And it was just, uh, you know, it was a, a miracle that we worked on a movie that actually was good. You know, and, and like, because look, I've been through the creative process myself and I got to work on some, you know, culturally significant things like GTA and stuff like that. And I get what you're saying, right? It, it, it's the, I never got to enjoy playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City, right? Like everybody loved that game. I never got to enjoy it. Where, where do you think it starts to like, is it that old Hannibal Lecter saying that like, you know, contempt comes from what you see every day or... How do you think that kind of decline starts happening from the first day at school to wanting to get the heck out of high school? I don't think there was any decline. I mean, there's just a lot of camaraderie. You know, on Friday nights, we'd get a couple of six packs and we'd, you know, throw darts and we just enjoyed work, working around each other, you know? So. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. There was a job to do. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and you yeah. did it well, so. The this stuff that you just did recently for the Mando, are, are, are you doing it as a consultant for ILM or are you doing it with your own uh, shop? Yeah, with my own shop. Cool. Yeah. Uh, John wanted uh, to have some stop motion. So, and it looks like they, they want some more. We're doing some other interesting stuff that we really can't talk about. Cool. Cool. Uh, was Grogu at all? Uh, I know he's a mechanical robot kind of thing, but was he stop motion at all when he walks? Was there any of that? Uh, the baby Yoda? No, he's all, you know, a puppet. They were going to do it. You know the story, right? They, no, no, no. Tell they, us. They were going to do it all as a, you know, computer graphic Yoda. And they right. just made this puppet, you know, as a stand in. And Herzog was, you know, had been hired to act in the episode and went, You guys are nuts. Just. Just use that little puppet. It totally worked. Yeah. Just like Yoda did, you know, the first time. And, um, yeah, that was – sometimes people need to, you know, get a reality check. <laughs> For, you know, it, it's just the fallback position is, oh, let's do it as a computer graphic because then we can do anything. We don't have to think that hard on the set. You know, so. Yeah, a little too much of that today. And I feel like you get more of a real acting anyways whenever something's right in front of you instead yeah. of like a – green screen blob. Go for Mark. Um, yeah, no, this is, uh, look, you know, to me, this is all, um, you know, fascinating because like I, I, I think a lot of these different disciplines that, that you um, had at your disposal back then, to your point, a lot have sort of converged into the CPU and, you know, there, there's no, you know, like there's not a ton of people working in the shop building models and, and, and like visualizing things in three dimensions, like, like in a tangible way. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, Oh, you know, a, a kind of a retro, let's go back to practical effects uh, type stuff um, with like the force awakens and stuff like that. Did you um, did you see the Force Awakens uh, just out of curiosity? Who which is the seventh? Who directed that's the, that, that? That's the J.J. Abrams one. I don't remember. That's the first one of the new ones, the one with Ray and. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't see it. I was invited to the premiere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what 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 were your some of your thoughts about that film? You know, I don't have very many nice things to say about franchises. Yeah. Well, I find them tedious. And why is that, you think? Franchises in general or this particular franchise? You're just saying in general, like film franchises. Yeah, just in general. It's boring. Why, why anybody would want to live in the same world, you know, forever? You know, it's because, you know, it's lucrative, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, so... 
And like, even in your film, though, you're saying that you're making a sequel. Isn't there also a lot to explore once you start to create uh, the rules and the physics of a world? Yeah, I don't think about it that much, you know? I mean, I, I just, you know, kind of get the vibe of what I want to do and just go for it and build it uh, along the way. So, you know, Mad God is, is quite dark. Mm. And the next thing <laughs> I want to do is, you know. Can you tell me about it? I don't know. I didn't, I don't know much about Mad God. No, I can't. I mean, there's no way that I could tell anybody about it. I mean, which is why I couldn't pitch it to a studio to try and get money out of it. They would never <laughs> understand. So it's, uh, it's uh, a, an alternative to the, the, you know, traditional three act, you know, structure of a movie or a lot of books. So I was just interested in uh, exploring uh, alternative narrative possibilities. Yeah, there, um, just to just to sort of fill theory, and I've seen some clips of Mad God, and it kind of has like, you know, you're probably not going to necessarily know this reference, but it, it has a little bit of a Fallout vibe to it, you know, like uh, um, post-apocalyptic. The um, the creatures are very heavily armored, and um, you know, some of the animation tests that I've seen for it are phenomenal. You know, you can you can see them on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if they're authorized or not authorized, if you let stuff out there or whatnot, but there is stuff out there that you can look at and it looks, it looks amazing. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it worked really well. It was quite arduous to do, but you know, now we're doing shooting, so I don't have that much to do. And, and, and how, how many folks worked on that with you? Is it, because it, it seems like it's kind of like, it's just you in the zone. Like, is it? Is there a whole team around it, or is it pretty much just you? you? Know, what, what happened was, you know, I, I had started this thing um, over 30 years ago. I mean, right after, I think 30 years ago, right after RoboCop 2. And I shot about six minutes of material, and the scope and scale of the thing was, was far too big, so I kind of had to put it to bed. And um, it just sat there. You know, and over the next 20 years, I, I I didn't really have any idea how I was going to pull it together. But I would go home at night and draw tons of storyboards and designs and read a lot of literature, you know, psychology and art history and, you know, archaeology and paleontology. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And um, that was the best that I, you know, that's exactly what I needed to do. I needed to spend a lot of time just locating myself in this world that I, I didn't even know what it was going to be. Mm. And then, um, and then I was archiving it, you know, about 12 years ago. And a couple of the guys that worked in my studio had, were inspired by, you know, the RoboCops and all that stuff and Star Wars, and uh, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to work with models and lights on the stage, but they missed that train and they were digital artists. So this, you know, they were looking over my shoulders. I was archived in the six minutes and they uh, volunteered to do a shot. And then that, it just exploded. It's just like, we got like a number of volunteers and I would get, you know, give talks locally and students you know would want to uh work on come work on it so you know sometimes i get up to 20 people on a saturday so i'd spend the week working out what i needed them to do i used them most of them were unskilled so um i'd work out processes that that i knew that they could accomplish and um yeah so that's how we made it one one thing that you mentioned that that just hearing you talk got me thinking since you've been working on this project for so long, were some of the pieces that you shot on 35 millimeter versus today on digital cameras? Are you integrating the two mediums? Yeah, they integrate perfectly. Nice. Yeah. You can't even tell the difference between the two, huh? Nope. That's very cool. Are you doing any kind of weird special effects stuff or any kind of post-processing to the digital cameras to give it a little bit more of that filmic quality? For some stuff, if we need to, like the whole very last part in the in the end of it, um, 
it's got a lot of experimental stuff that needed to be enhanced with digital stuff. I think, you know, we've got stuff in it at, at the end that's, you know, in some ways better than some of the space stuff in 2001. I mean, all the liquid dispersion stuff. Wow. Not the, not the Doug Trumbull stuff that he did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are powerful words that I'm excited. Um, Theory, you have a you have a question? Because I can just no, keep I'm, going. I, I'm just, no, I'm just listening to you guys talk. You, you guys have a lot more experience in all of this stuff than I do. I mean, so I'm just learning. You, you know, one, one thing that I am curious on, uh, Phil, while I have you here, and you've been so generous with your time and your thoughts, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, I know, um, like, like Tony Soprano says, uh, remember when is the lowest form of, of conversation. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I think that, that there's a lot to learn, right, for young creators when they see, uh, you know, the benefit of the experiences of, of somebody that deals with, you know, the reality of making something wonderful. And to that point, um, you're, I think, again, back to Jurassic Park, which is, I think, one of the most important films ever made, um, because it is the kind of nail on the coffin in some ways for, um, for the whole motion, you know, stop motion, practical effect thing started to change drastically after Jurassic Park. And you personally being right in the middle of it um, and getting affected by it, I'm sure, very heavily, but then also winning an Academy Award for your work in Jurassic Park. Was that a bittersweet thing or was it all sweet or was it all bitter? It was, it was a vertical climb, you know, because computer graphics were completely antithetical to the way I think and operate. Sitting at a desk was appalling to me. So I didn't have to do that. I had people that did. And, um, you know, it's just like you change with the times, you know, and, you know, you, uh, and it forced you to reinvent yourself, you know. I didn't particularly like it, uh, the, the process, but, you know, it was like, you know, well, that's what, <laughs> that's how you make things now. And you either do it that way or you don't at all. You don't work. How, how do you, how do you, because I think that that's such a valuable lesson. I've had to go through that in my own career like that moment where you know if like the butterfly i don't adapt to this situation i will go extinct like how how do you personally like how did you sort of rewire your brain to to be able to embrace things and and turn it into your own like what kind of advice can you give to somebody that's going through that kind of moment well, on Jurassic Park, again, it was like for all of us, it was a vertical climb. and We were just inventing stuff as we went. You know, a lot of times we, you know, let's try this, let's try that. You know, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's all, you know, ultimately experimental, you know, within the framework of the, of the story. Yeah, fair enough. You looking at me? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at you. I'm like, you know, no, I'm mean, no, mostly, mostly is... yeah, most of the stuff I would want to ask is about, you know, the story and the creation and stuff. But I feel like, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, we have a little bit of time here. We'll let you go very soon. You've been very kind with your time, sir. And, and, you know, everybody should go be on the lookout for uh, Mad God by Phil Tippett. I'm sure it's going to be mad and it's going to be godly and it's going to be friggin' awesome. Um, is there any way that the fans can support uh, your work currently? Is there anywhere that we can send them? Um, to like, you know, get a little sneak peek, a trailer, or just no, support it in general. Uh, you know, I'll be on uh, Twitter supporting it, and um, you know, I've got uh, you know uh, PR people that are going to be putting the uh, what do we call them? Uh, Marketing. Yeah, but it's called something different this, these days. It's like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, everything, everything's something different. One, one of you know, one of those things that uses you know, uh, oh, social media guy. Yeah, that's what. He <laughs> right, right. One of those. Uh, yeah, social media guy. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we all have those, I guess, nowadays. Um, yeah, yeah. No, that's cool. Look, I'm, I'm very excited about that. But theory, uh, before we go here, I'd love to dig into some of your story questions that 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 you were thinking about i asked most of them already um all right cool was, yeah that was essentially 
all the questions that I had that were they were asked, and the rest of it was just learning and uh, observing what you guys had to say, which is great. Yeah, no, it's um, is there anything for the future that that you're interested in maybe exploring, Phil? Like maybe a trip back into the paleontology or or some other crazy thing that is completely out of left field that is you know innovative and new that you want to explore or anything any stones left unturned no no i'm i you know i burned <laughs> through all these things you know i got tired of space aliens and tired of <laughs> robots and tired of dinosaurs you know you just want to move on you know yeah. and, uh, and grow and hollywood didn't let you do that in fact you know we were so lucky to have George and Steven and Verhoeven to work with, and then everything just became so corporatized mm. that um, I don't watch it unless some, somebody points me to it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, we didn't touch on that, but I know it's a fan favorite, and, and I'm, I'm sure that the fans want to hear about it. Um, can you share some thoughts about working on Starship Troopers and what, what that was like? Yeah, that was the biggest show I I had ever done, and the really? most rewarding as well. Yeah, I mean that was a huge leap, you know, because wow. in, in Jurassic there was only a few, you know, you know, a handful of dinosaurs, but we had to have thousands of bugs. I have no idea how we we're gonna pull it off, but somehow we did. You know, it was great working with Paul. You know, we we kind of had the you know the Vulcan mind meld thing going on. And oh, that's cool. Spoke, spoke the same language. You know, politically we're we're very similar. So um, yeah, no, it was uh, he was my favorite director to work with. Really, Paul Ver Verhoeven. I, I I always pronounce his name incorrectly. I think Verhoeven. Verhoeven. But uh, Total Recall, you know, one of my favorites and Starship Troopers. And um, so that's cool. Like, how do you, how do you, what, what are the hallmarks of that mind meld? That's such an important thing, I think, when you're trying to recruit collaborators. Like, are there hallmarks in an, like, when you engage a new collaborator where you know this is a simpatico, this is actually going to work? Like, is there something that you've seen repeated in the pattern from that perspective? Yeah, you just want to get what you want. And John Davis and the producer kind of deputized me and Ed Newmeyer as co-producers, which gave us, you know, a lot of authority on the set. And, um, you know, and Paul has called me, you know, he said there's three directors. There was, you know, uh, Vic Armstrong, who did second unit, and Paul, and then me. So right. Was, you know, I mean, he, he acknowledged that the immensity of the thing, you know, to come up with ideas. Hey, what if we did this? How would we do this? Hey, we need a shadow falling over this guy you now. And so he was, you know, he, he would always take, you know, suggestions. That's See, cool. my, my question would be when it came to creating the vehicles, um, like the at, at um, there was a question in chat that I just saw, you know, what were some of the other vehicles that influenced these movements? Um, like, was it tanks? Was it, was it perhaps animals? Um, Anything for the walkers? Yeah, yeah. No, it was like well, it was basically a, a uh, you know creature's physiognomy with the yeah you know, was made out of metal. So uh, you know, I mean, we had to do a lot of experimentation in terms of uh, figuring out how to. We went to a wild animal park and shot thirty-five millimeter of uh, elephants and whatnot. And I would study mm -hmm. those and we'd start off with that as the basis um, and duplicating an elephant walk. And then re we realized with that, the elephant's only like, you know, 12 feet tall, but the walkers are like 150 feet tall. So their scale had to be adjusted in terms of what their footfall patterns were. So the walkers always had to have uh, three feet on the ground at one time and, you know, only one leg moving forward to convincingly uh, portray it as big. See, that's really cool. You, you wouldn't think that you have to go out and analyze other animals walking well, around. Well, that's, you always need a starting point. You don't just make shit up. You know? I love that. And, um, and uh, so you start, and it may not be in the right place. Generally, it's not. 
but you know, you open a door and that shows you another door and then you open that and that shows you another door. And it's just, you know, part of the process. Were there other concepts for the, for the ad at? Was it, was it going to look like something else that you wanted? Well, it was going to be some radio control wheeled vehicles at, at some point. But oh, yeah. that got mixed. Gotcha. You know, what, one of the things that I get a kick out of when I get to interview folks like like yourself and Paul Hirsch and Dennis Murin and all that stuff is all like the cool stuff that they have in the background. It's one of the new things that kind of this whole virtual interview thing has given us. And I'm seeing a real eclectic thing back there. I'm seeing uh, what it looks like a dream catcher. But then is that is that a stuffed primate behind you? That That creature back there? Oh, it's not a dream catcher. It's actually, it, it, it's a job. It, it's a, it's a lamp. A lamp. Mm, I don't see what it. are you looking at, Mark? Right there, right there. That looks like a Japanese lamp from like the Karate Kid Part Two in Okinawa. You know, like the ones that like, like, like were floating around. Like from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Part Three. That, yeah, yeah. No, that, no, no. Hanging up. The, uh, right there. Yeah, right there. Oh yeah, it's a uh, lamp from the Chinese restaurant. Cool. Oh, okay, cool. And, and is that some kind of primate that you have stuffed in there? Is that one of the creatures that you've designed? Like underneath what? the lamp back there? Underneath the lamp back there. Mark, yeah, yeah, you right, can point at it. Right right off your shoulder, right off of this shoulder. Over here. Over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that There you go, right there, yeah. Yeah, what is that? That's cool looking. Right, Right underneath your finger, there's like a creature. That looks like it's about to like jump and eat that squirrel. I have no idea. You know, um, this that is, thing, yeah. all, all of these uh, crosses are Celtic crosses. They're not Christian crosses. And that blue print on the wall is a uh, Mobius print that uh, signed when he was alive. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. Well, look, uh, you've given us an hour of your time. That's more, way more than, than we ever could have expected. Um, I appreciate you, Phil, so much. Um, so thank I. you. Thank you yeah. for everything you've made. It's uh, yeah. played a big role in my creative process and, and just being a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very well. We all were very lucky, you know. To live in that yeah. Place. And look, and, and we continue to be lucky that folks like yourself are still pushing the medium forward and experimenting with stuff that might not be what the studios are funding, but it's definitely. Um, you know, what the, what I think the fans want to see, right? Like, you know, we go to the movies or we used to go to the movies to see something new that we've never seen before on screen, not the same thing over again. With well, a new... I don't know about that. You know, I mean, with these franchises, yeah, they're super popular, but like all the Marvel things and, and yeah. what, it's just Coca-Cola. They've got people hooked on this stuff, you know, and, you know, they make, Billions of dollars, so they keep making it. But you know, they're pretty darn thin as far as yeah. You know, I I care. Yeah, look, I I I don't disagree with you. Is there any sort of mainstream piece of cinema that you've seen in the last five, ten years that has inspired you? You know, you know, to say, okay, that that's going in the right direction. I was that's reading an article with an interview with Scorsese, mm -hmm. and he was. You know, complaining that there is no fantastic cinema that's come out for years where it creates this kind of uh, excitement that Jurassic or Star Wars did. And he said the last time, as far as he could tell, and I, I agree with him, was Gravity. And, you know, that galvanized the world. I mean, everybody was like, holy shit, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the last time anything like that. I mean, there have been a number of, you know, good films, but, you know, uh, something of that level of spectacle, you know, that just totally grabs you. And, like, what do you think is the blocker? What do you think is preventing uh, the studios from investing in that kind of artwork? Money. Money. Just pure, like, what they perceive oh, as the return on investment. Do, you have to do the same thing over and over and over and over in various, you know, in different variations, you know, but, you know, it's like pretty bankrupt as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's not bankrupt. They're making billions. But... <laughs> right, right. But, but uh, creatively bankrupt. 
Um, and, and just, you know, look, um, if anybody's out there from the studios listening, this is, uh, you know, um, the man and Oscar winner, Phil Tippett, BAFTA winner, Emmy winner, winner of just about every major award you can have. And, and he's got these real legitimate feelings. You know, you should probably consider them as something to think about. Um, but in any case, if you guys want to finish, uh, keep going with the conversation, go to starwarstheory.com. Uh, Star Wars Theory and I have been uh, working very, very hard on that. We have, hopefully in the next few weeks, we're actually going to start streaming uh, video natively on that site. We're, we're, we're trying to add new uh, features um, to starwarstheory.com. Theory and I basically made our own blockchain-based uh, website uh, to try to, you know, um, give back um, to the people a little bit. So, um, in any is case, that, brother, I'm is sorry. That, is that your real name, Star? You know, Theory. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my on my ID it says Star Wars Theory. That's the name that my parents gave me. <laughs> it's a stage name. It's a stage no. Name. It's it's a, it's a channel name that I've had since the beginning, and um, people just would call me Theory, and and I said, okay, you know what? At three million, I'll just reveal my name, and I, and we're almost there. Maybe in another month or so, and right. it's become a thing now. So yeah, I'll just milk it a little bit. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, you should get a, make a guessing game out of it. And give you know, <laughs> right. somebody a prize. Yeah, like yeah. That. You know how the Do you have a guess? Is. Do you have a guess as to what his name is? No. No. <laughs> I don't think he gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Yeah. Well, all right. all right. Phil, well, thank you so much for your time, sir. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you I very much. I appreciate it too. You're Thanks welcome. For the chat. Take care. See ya. Bye bye. Bye.